Thank you, Mary. I'm also going to read um, a piece from this book called Church of the Wild by Victoria Wurst. And she has, with a couple of other pastors from different denominations, created the Wild Church Network back in 2016. And we can talk a little bit about that at another time. But I wanted to bring up a couple of pieces that really sparked me recently. John is said to have been fulfilling the message of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. In the wilderness, the Isaiah passage says, we prepare the way. But when the same translators repeated Isaiah's message in Matthew, they decided to change the punctuation the quote was changed to a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. This small detail places the reference to wilderness on the location of the voice rather than the location of the preparations that must be made. John's message is one that should draw all the followers of Jesus into the literal wilderness for their own preparation. The translators and preachers have de-emphasized this part of the message, collaborating with a long history of detachment from nature. It's one thing to accept that John's spirituality was deeply grounded in the wilderness, but the idea that people might be called into the wilderness themselves to prepare the way that is riskier. So in our new outdoor ministry of the Minnesota Conference, where we have lost a sacred place, this camp, we are now not bound by a specific place. We have become the people in the Older Testament. Adam and Eve were given this wonderful garden, and yet because of their own desires to have everything, they squandered it and were sent out into the wilderness. The Canaanites were sent out into the wilderness. Abraham and Sarah were sent out to the wilderness. And along the way, they created spaces where people could stop on their own journeys to reflect on all that the God around them was sharing. This continues as we get into Moses, leading the Israelites into the wilderness. But a lot of times we look at that wilderness especially for the Israelites, as a place where they were fleeing, not a place where they were just journeying along and spending time with God. So as we move into this new way of being outdoor ministry, I'm hoping that we can then influence some of our churches to think outside of these buildings, not as just as people that we normally like to think of, but to think about what is it that we hear in the sanctuary that can then move us out into the wilderness to hear, to feel, to see, to taste God among us. Even in this city of thousands of people, God is with us. Now, how many of you, raise your hand, like to spend time 
out camping or taking a nice walk in the woods or maybe fishing. Yeah? So what are the things you like to do? Fishing. Fishing? What else? Eating fish. <laughs> <laughs> what else do we have? Walking. Walking? Well, I sit in my backyard and I watch the birds settle in for the evening. Yes, yeah. Hiking. Hiking, watching the birds. Biking. Biking. Kayaking. Kayaking. You know, we just came from living out in a rural area. We had very few trees. The trees that we had were ones that we planted because it used to be a pasture. Now sure, we had deer that would run through. We even had coyotes run through. A few skunks brighten up our day. Yes, nature is alive. Uh, we had cows all around us. The farmer up the road had uh, bison that we could watch sometimes would come down and you know, invade other people's uh, crops. <laughs> we had birds, we had eagles, we had hawks. But the funny thing is that when we moved into this smaller metro area, surrounded by houses, surrounded by cars, surrounded by planes, we're actually seeing more wildlife on a regular basis. We have crows, we have pigeons. The neighbor has ducks that somewhere are nesting on his roof. <laughs> We're not sure about that. We have the chickadees, we have hummingbirds, we have squirrels, oh my, do, do we have squirrels? And we even have an albino squirrel. So it is fun to just sit in the backyard and hear all of these things. That's what God is asking us to do. Let's think about Jesus walking into the wilderness after he has washed himself from all of the angst and misunderstandings and all of the just the ickiness of the world in the Jordan River, a river of fresh water. He walks into the wilderness, and we think that he's been tested this whole time. But what if he's actually going out in the wilderness to find his place within this world, to be able to truly sense the God within him and the God surrounding him, that God that is working within his soul and the God that spreads everything from him. Sounds a little different then, doesn't it? We are asked to be people that are connected to this earth, not a building, not to say that church is a bad thing. I'll be the first to say we need our buildings, especially in rural areas. It's a place of connection. But when we go deeper, we need to go into those wild spaces and listen carefully. So I want to add this. If I can find it again. Jesus went into the mountains to pray. This fact seems important. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first three books in the New Testament, all mention it. So it makes sense that learning how to pray is a big agenda for the churches. Centering prayer, to say prayer, silent prayer, petition prayer, liturgical prayer, confession prayer, prayer without ceasing prayer. Prayers for the people prayer. But when was the last time you were taught how to go to the mountains? Jesus didn't go to the buildings to pray. Jesus went to the mountain, or along the lake shore, or to the wilderness. For some reason, well, for many reasons, that part of the spiritual journey is generally ignored. So this week, I want you to consider wilderness. I want you to put on whatever hat you need. 
and step in to the great wide world of God in all the natural spaces that we call the limits. Amen. So let us sing 